and good morning, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, John. Again, my name is Mike Rafferty. I am the, the commercial product representative for Unilock, Michigan. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Unilock, we manufacture concrete paving stones and segmental retaining wall systems for the landscape and construction industries. And in fact, we're proud to say that we were the first manufacturer to produce a concrete paving stone and a permeable paver in North America. And uh, I definitely encourage you to stop by our booth, um, number two, during lunch, to get some additional information. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce Doug Farr. Doug is founding principal of Farr Associates, an award-winning architecture and planning firm, widely regarded as one of the most sustainable design practices in the country. The firm's three lead platinum buildings are models of urban architectural sustainability. Based on the firm's pioneering sustainable urban design practice and his insights gained serving as the inaugural chair of lead neighborhood development, Doug authored the planning bestseller, Sustainable Urbanism, Urban Design with Nature. Please join me in welcoming Doug. Good morning. How we doing? All right. You know, I guess got to confess, to be a planning bestseller is kind of small. You know, honestly, <laughs> it's not John Grisham. It's not Steve Larson. But... Uh, you know, mom and dad are proud, so all the good things. So I don't know, you heard who I am. Who are you? Are there any senators in the room? <laughs> mayors, any mayors? Elected officials, council members? Okay, we're hitting a dry well here. So, okay, uh, people that work for government, few of you. Planners, architects, engineers, landscape architects, few developers, eco environmentalists, ecologists, who am I forgetting? Bus drivers. What is it? Cit yeah, citizens. School board, School board members, very nice. Voters. OK, all right, we got a sense of who we are. So good, good mix, mix crap. So what I want to talk about today is a new tool, and with it, the opportunities that go with the introduction of a new tool. So these are you know, challenging times uh, out in the world. At the same time, I think this is uh, what I want to talk about today, which is lead neighborhood development, or lead ND, I think is a bright, shining uh, uh, promise of hope going forward. So it's a tool. It's not going to scratch your back. It's not going to give you a massage. It's not going to make you prettier than you are. But it's a tool out there, and I want to kind of acquaint you with it, why it exists, how you can use it, and, uh, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. And this is the one part of sustainability that's sort of a pleasure uh, to talk about. So often sustainability feels like uh, you know, it's hard, it's technology, it's denial. This is you know, the picture I want to show you is people hanging out on a street drinking, right? That's sustainable, right? So, and that's that's what I think Lead ND uh, hopefully uh, will lead us to. Now, it's not the norm. I mean, I think the norm we all appreciate this. We are all specialists. We come at this whole big uh, opportunity called sustainability from some corner of expertise, right? So, you can s see that as silos. And so, I think Lead ND is probably a tool that emphasizes the coming together, the breaking down of silos, the opportunities that reside between the silos and by connecting the silos. And so uh, anyway, just, uh, just to recognize that. The second thing that I think is important to recognize um, is this, this paradox of, of efficiency. So one would think that sustainability is about making the devices of everyday life consume less energy. Gee, if our cars got a million miles a gallon, we'd be fixed, right? If the light, lights took no energy, it'd be fixed. The ironic part of that is as you make things more efficient, we consume more of them, right? Because it costs less. Rational, makes sense. So efficiency alone won't get you there because we'll just use more stuff. We're, we're like that, we're humans. We're humans, go figure. So anyway, getting beyond, getting beyond just the idea that efficiency will get, get you there. What's the check and balance once it's super efficient to not just use more of it? So one of the things, one of the bright lights of the last 10 or 15 years in sustainability has been the LEED Green Building Movement, which is well known to Southwest Michigan as a, as a leader into Grand Rapids, a very proud designation in the last six weeks as a leading sustainable city. Well known here, 
Um, however, it ain't perfect, right? So here you see from the air uh, a picture of a lead platinum building. If you know the lead system, there's levels, and platinum's the highest, uh, which is really a major achievement. At the same time, look at this. Look at this, if you will. So there's the building right in the middle of the site. I've perped it out because I don't want you to know who it is or where it is or what it is. But why would I do that? Look at how there's almost perfection, right, within the property lines. This is what lead is about. Like, where's your property lines? We're going to make that really good. Step across the property line. What do you get here? Concrete and asphalt, right? And then you get a Michigan, Michigan highway, right, or Michigan street, um, uh, often called the Houston highway. You know, it, this is Michigan, but it's Houston highway. And the definition of a Houston highway is a street. If you see a pedestrian on it, it's because their car broke down, right? <laughs> So, so there's a lead platinum building in a kind of oasis of sacrifice zone, a disaster, a place you would never walk unless your car broke down, right? So lead buildings, one at a time, are clearly not fixing the planet perfectly, right? Not to say we shouldn't do it. I'm a full endorser, but we can see its limitations. One of the more interesting areas where we see the limitations of the one building at a time approach is in schools. So we had, remember back in, 2007, 2008, we had an economy and we were making money. We had, a, we had an intern that summer. We had enough money. We had an intern. It was great. So put this intern on all the not-for-not-not-money-making not projects, one of which was to take a uh, look in the LEED database and look at 10 green schools around the country, just randomly selected. What he found was interesting. It was this, that th three of the 10 fit this description, where there was an existing school, in this case, this is West Brazos, Texas, it's kind of near Houston, there was an existing school in a small town, and a decision was made to build a new green school. So where did they build it? They built it three miles outside of town on a highway, right? So the old school was the kind of neighborhood walk-to school that people had been uh, attending for 60 or 70 years in the town. The new green school was now out on the highway, and you had to be bused or driven to the school. So the old school, which you know the whole town had grown up going to, was not considered green. But the new one got a nice plaque to prove that it was green. And when you read the write-up about what makes this green, well, there, there's a big parking lot. But you know what? The new green school filters the stormwater coming off the parking lot that the old school didn't need. So anyway, so the new school is considered green. The old one not. So again. You know, we have to exercise judgment. So we're adults. It's a tool. It has limitations. Use it by all means, but we want to fix it. This is what's called a cheap shot. Could this be a green building? Absolutely, right? So this is, um, no one wants to own up to where this is, but we think it's California. Um, <clears throat> But you know what? What would lead ask about this picture? It would ask, "Are the escalators efficient? Not are they needed? Not is it a goofy idea? But are they efficient?" Or it might ask, "Is the gleaming stainless steel there recycled or virgin?" Right? Asking important questions, but not relevant to this the idiocy before you. Right? So again, we have to be adults. It's a very faint slide, which allows me to tell you that. Um, our little practice in Chicago, we're 18 people. We do architecture and planning. And so we get to look at those opportunities between those scales of work to find those synergies that we're talking about. So um, our motto, implementing sustainable urbanism from room to region, where every increment of architecture and planning aspires to perfect the city. Pretty good. Right. So back, I want to tell you sort of my aha moment. Here it is. So in 1998, we got hired to do what's called a TOD, a Transit-Oriented Development Plan, for this site on the west side of Chicago. And um, I thought it was an incredibly sustainable project. What was sustainable about it? It fostered a mix of uses. It was reusing land that had been previously developed and then torn down and sort of uh, overlooked, if you will. It was uh, introducing needed goods and services to neighbors, people that didn't have them. It was reusing a brownfield site, all these sorts of things. So great right, promoting transit ridership, things like this. Great sustainable project, right, 1998. On the desk next to that was this project, which started the next year, the Chicago Center for Green Technology. Um, and I'm gonna, I may cry here. I just got to confess that. Because when I talk about this slide, I always say that it was 
the first green building by um, Richard Daly, and I usually crack the joke, mayor for life, right? So if you didn't hear, he's indicated he's not running for re-election. So, uh, but anyway, this was the first green building that the city of Chicago did, and uh, we were uh, the lead architects for that, and very exciting, and also a very sustainable project. And what was it about? It was about energy efficiency, it was about water, things like that. Um, you know, it, uh, there's pictures of it from the area. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, you know, the roof is covered with green roof and photovoltaic panels uh, in the ways we know that green buildings now do a lot, um, and so on. And so it had a list of sort of sustainable things it did, very much driven by lead. And the aha moment was I was standing in the office, the, the TOD was on this desk, CCGT on this desk, and I realized they're both really sustainable projects and they have no overlap. No overlap. We weren't doing water in the first one, we weren't doing energy in the first one, we weren't doing urban in the second one, all these sorts of things. And that was the aha moment. Like, how can we have these silos in our seemingly very sustainable office? So we went back <clears throat> and uh, actually bought some better colored markers, because the previous drawing you almost could not see. It was so uh, uh, brown and dreary. So, But we re-rendered that first drawing um, and rethought it and basically said, can we take the agenda from LEED for buildings and apply it at the scale of a master planned uh, development, in this case a TOD, about 10, 12 acres. And so what we thought of at the moment, which uh, you know is fun to look back at, was this idea that all the buildings, of course, would get you know roofs that were intensively used first, filtering stormwater, reducing heat island, uh, generating electricity, things like that. But the big sort of innovation under the hood, if you will, is this idea that for the first time we're proposing that none of the buildings have their own mechanical system, that it's an all, all district system. I forgot to tell one part of the story from CCGT. Uh, one of the integrated design features was we put the geothermal uh, uh, heating and cooling system under the pond, where the thermal transfer is more efficient. So it's a good deal. Engineers will tell you, you know, you, you spend, spend money wisely when you did that. So we stole that idea and said, let's make this what looks to be just a kind of a passive lawn park into an instrument of common infrastructure. And let's put a geothermal field under there, drain the streets uh, into, into the park, uh, and, and so on. So this was the aha moment. My goodness, could we make it easier to finance this? Because there's a separate profit-making venture in uh, managing uh, and making profits from the district energy systems. So we took the show on the road. This is now 2000, 2001, down to a town in Illinois called Normal. When your town is called normal, you have to work a lot harder. You do. Uh, every town you know, has their issues, but their, theirs was their name, right? Otherwise, a great group of people, very unlikely kind of national leaders in this stuff. But we did a, a master plan for them, a TOD. Uh, here's the train track, the Amtrak line from Chicago to St. Louis. Here's our little master planned downtown, um, adopted by city council in 2001. And uh, in 2002, Normal became the first town in the United States to require LEED certified buildings. Ahead of Portland, Seattle, all the auspicious leaders here, even ahead of Grand Rapids. My goodness, how'd that happen? So, um, but a great uh, moment. So this was 2002. And at the center of it was the sort of first execution of this idea of uh, a common public space that was an instrument of, of shared infrastructure. In this case, it was to the idea was to take the stormwater off the um, streets and buildings, filter it, and make it uh, a source of, of delight. We also, in doing this project, where the sort of the space, I'll go back one, the space was sort of a cylinder, if you will, around a, uh, a, you know, a, a roundabout, traffic roundabout, uh, with the intention to occupy the center, which breaks every rule, by the way, every rule. We had a three-year fight with USDOT, why? Because the engineers thought that human beings should not occupy the center of a roundabout. So, uh, and rules are written to absolutely enforce this. So we finally got it approved by calling it a circular intersection. And what was brilliant about that, not my idea, I wish, wish I had thought of it, uh, was that since circular intersections don't exist, there are no rules to them. So we aren't breaking any, right? So just title it right. So, but anyway, to get the buildings around this sort of cylinder, we had to uh, become sophisticated in something called form-based coding, which I know is, 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 has some uh, uh, very nice examples in Michigan. 
but, but here, here it is. The first building built into this code um, was this children's museum. The code calls for buildings of minimum three stories height. So we sort of form-based codes invert things rather than setting uh, capping things that we want more of. We call for minimum. So every building built downtown has to be three stories. Can't build a one-story building. Build that somewhere else. This We want three-story buildings. We want arcades. We want certain materials and so on. Here is that circle uh, defying the engineers, the idea that humans could occupy the center of it. The economy, you see that hole in the ground. This is uh, one of the sad sort of stories of the economy. Um, you know, developer broke ground, six-story building, and then lost their financing. So they put, you know, money in a hole. But it'll, it'll come back in the years to come. But here's kids playing where the engineers said humans would never choose to go, right? So there's kids. Here's college students at, at uh, Illinois State uh, cooling, their, cooling their dogs on a hot summer day in the fountain, right? And so this breaks, you know, 10 or 12 different rules, right? Because the, the, the lawyers in America say don't make any public water feature more than a quarter inch deep because then no one can drown, right? So, you know, what's the fun of a quarter inch, right? I mean, it's, it's okay, but so there's a few inches, right? So it, it all works. It's not, it didn't change, it didn't destroy the world. So with these projects, we realized that we had it, we were onto something we couldn't define, so we sat down and defined it. We called it sustainable urbanism, and we defined it this way. Walkable, transit-served urbanism, integrated with high-performance buildings and high-performance infrastructure. So all those things working together. So try, trying really hard to overcome the silos, right? So that was it. And that led to writing this book, which is you know, for sale in the break, and we'll sign it, and you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, the, the book itself had a fairly ambitious thesis, which was that sustainable urbanism will just take over the planet by 2030, right? So you're now part of this takeover plan, right? Um, either you're being taken over, or you're being infiltrated, or I'm not sure what's happening to you exactly today, but, but that was the premise. The, the idea being, it just is so much better than how we do things today, right? If we can learn the new system. We don't have to uh, tinker with the old one. We just adopt the new one. Let it, let it coast. It'll be fine. So that's it. There were, the writing of the book pointed us to a couple of um, absolutely inspiring projects, and I'm going to talk about just one. This one is, um, I'll slip to the pictures because it's more interesting to see a picture. This is called BedZed. People have heard of BedZed. Few people, few. Good. Uh, it's in England. I just visited it last month for the first time. It's south of England. And it's the first project internationally that aspired to um, perform in what's called one, uh, one ecological footprint. There's a metaphor for this idea that our lifestyles consume a certain amount of acreage of the earth and that Americans seem to need four and a half planets to keep us going. Um, and that's kind of an issue because we can't find the other three and a half. Um, in the UK, it's slightly lower. They're uh, more efficient as a nation. but the goal of this was could we could the project build a modern amenity development um, that respected 1.0 ecological footprints, a metaphor. So here it is. And so it's essentially attached row houses with solar panels. You see those sort of brightly colored wind vanes. Those are devices that replace fans for inducing drafts and ventilation through the buildings. They actually work. It's a somewhat more moderate uh, climate than we have, uh, a little drier, a, a little just moderate in temperature. Um, but anyway, so, so there it is. Um, it had district energy systems, district wastewater systems, share cars, et cetera, et cetera. The goal was to build it for no construction premium. It had a construction premium. So that was part of the vision that was not uh, fulfilled. But at the, at the end of it, what, what was most interesting to me is that they set this goal of 1.0. And they think they got to about 1.2 planets, you know, so they were close, down from the UK average of three and a half. And when asked, how'd you get from three and a half to 1.2? And they said, well, roughly speaking, two thirds of it was technology. It was, you know, the solar panels, the insulation, the shared walls, the ventilation, so on. Uh, a third of it was changes in conduct, right? People adapting to a place and making different decisions. And so that two thirds, one third split, I actually think understates. When, we're, when we get good at the technology and better at the uh, uh, influencing people's conduct, I think it's going to be half and half. That's, that's what sustainability will be about in the future. So if you're focused only on the hardware side, there's a whole half of the economy you aren't touching. So big, big opportunities there. 
So lead ND is what I'm here actually to talk about today, and that was sort of a necessary kind of building up to uh, lead ND. Why? Because I, um, we got, we had problems with clients, frankly. These, these pesky clients, they just don't do what we want them to do, right? And what do we want them to do? We wanted them to uh, embrace this idea of master plan developments that had green features in them and integrated systems. And we kept getting pushback and saying, you know, to, no, 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 the engineers are going to do the engineering, the architects are going to do the ar architecture, and this blurring of things, uh, stop it, right? So and we just weren't getting anywhere. So we realized that we watched lead take off and how that was really a powerful force in the marketplace. Um, if you complain about something long enough, they put you in charge of it. So I was chair of lead ND from 2003 to 2008. What is it in kind of in a nutshell? It's the 10 principles of smart growth intellectually, 10 principles of smart growth, the CNU charter, and the, the lead brand, right? Those three things mashed together make up lead ND. If you don't know the 10 principles of smart growth, they're here. Please don't study them or read them quickly. That's, that'll just make your head hurt. What's important about them is that they were written 15 years ago and that they're very um, kind of popular. They are written to appeal in 50 states, red and blue, in suburbs and cities and rural areas, and that pretty much everybody finds something that they like in them. So they're very sort of smartly crafted to create a big tent. On the flip side, they're not very precise. And actually, internally, some things are in conflict with others and so on. So you'll, you'll hear more about this in a minute. You'll hear more about this in a minute. Second was the CNU, the Congress for New Urbanism. And if you haven't heard about it, there's a Michigan chapter of CNU. Any members of CNU Michigan here? A few of you. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, and you know much can be said about that. But uh, I'll just say that it's a, a very powerful movement that is beginning to pick up lead ND was one of the co-authors of it. Um, but uh, we'll talk more about that. So lead ND highlights. What the heck is it? Um, you know, it's a first ever national certification standard for sustainable land developments, more than one building uh, uh, on the ground, right? It's pitched both to the private sector and to government. You can certify a plan at the paper stage, at the entitled stage, and at the built stage, three stages. Um, prerequisites and credits, there are 12 prereqs, we'll see them in a minute. Um, lead ND introduced the lead system to base 10. Prior to lead ND, uh, lead was based on base 69. We're not sure why, but we led the way to figure out our path to base 10. So that's good. 100 credits, and, and uh, so the certification levels are 40, 50, 60, and 80 for you wonks, and then 10 bonus on top. In 2007, we started a pilot program that um, uh, encompassed 208 U.S. projects and 29 uh, in Canada. And I think Michigan missed out. Did that happen? I think that happened. So that's why we're talking. To, well, let's talk. Who are talking today? Let's talk. Um, there are 42 states uh, and the District of Columbia, and then several foreign countries that don't appear on this map, as you might imagine. So, But a lot of people, 50, 50 plus projects in California alone, so we got a lot of data. This was beta testing. This was you know, people subjecting their beloved projects to a certification standard that didn't exist at the time they designed it. So there were a lot of gnashing of gears and you know, pulling of hair and things like that. But we learned a lot, and we have a better standard now. So why was it developed? It was written by these three groups, the GBC, the CNU, and NRDC, representing the smart growth movement. Um, and if I, this is my subjective view of why people came to the table to do this. Those 10 smart growth principles that I mentioned, um, the smart growth folk would get in trouble. They'd say, you know, what kind of development do you want here, Mr. or Mrs. Smart Growth person? They'd say, well, read our 10 principles. We told you already. It's like, they're not precise enough, right? So they needed something that was more operational, if you will. The CNU was encountering resistance to walkable, you know, little traditional neighborhood projects from people posing as um, environmentalists who simply were you know, neighbors in opposition. And they'd all stand up and say, you know what, all this compact stuff with all these streets and little blocks and all this stuff, that's not environmental. Environmental is one acre lots. Environmental is cul-de-sacs. Environmental is conservation subdivisions. This urbanism, that's not environmental. And they'd get you know, turned down and 
you know, planning commissioners don't maybe know, right? Oh, well, somebody said it wasn't environmental. I voted against it, right? So, so we needed an endorsement, a stamp of approval. So that was it. And then USGBC was struggling with projects it was getting where it wasn't just one building. There was multiple buildings. Some of them were college campuses. Um, and then there were some master plan developments. So this, this, they, this was the one they chose to, to go forward with, uh, much to our benefit. Um, it's organized in these three sections, which very much align with the partners' you know, uh, agendas. Uh, where is your project? And that's called smart location and linkage. And that's very much of the mantra of the smart growth movement. Excuse me. The second one is, what are you doing within your project boundaries? And that's called neighborhood pattern and design. And that's very much the sort of domain of the CNU. Uh, and then the third one is called green infrastructure and building. And that really is the lead principles applied to everything in your project boundary. So if you've got streets and energy generation and so on, uh, that's what that's about. So and there's the list of prerequisites and credits. Um, I'll just mention a few. These are prerequisites. These are things you shall do, you must do, to certify a project. Um, so <clears throat> most, I would say 25% of our five years working on this was spent fighting about the first one, <laughs> smart location. Defining what, you know, taking those 10 principles of smart growth and codifying it to a level where you got it right, right? So uh, I'll just say read it on your own, but it's, it's very finessed. Uh, no one's happy with it, which means we were successful in equally peeving everybody, right? So that's the sign of a perfect compromise. Nobody likes it, right? So, uh, but everyone can live with it. And then other things which are more focused on um, uh, um, preservation of natural features. Second one, neighborhood pattern design. I'll just highlight one called walkable streets. This is a requirement. It's a prerequisite. You got to have walkable streets. So that means no cul-de-sacs with dead ends and I can't walk there. No longer sustainable. Sorry, uh, you know, not qualified, right? And other things, right? And then in the third one, GIB, I just highlight the one called minimum building energy efficiency. At the time we wrote Lead ND, the green building uh, members on the core committee writing it thought lead was not very demanding in energy. So they said, uh, we're not going to follow that model. We're, gonna <laughs> we're not going to follow that model. What we're going to do is treat our project boundary like a floating energy code, uh, meaning we require every building in the development to be 10% uh, you know, better than, than ASHRAE, the current ASHRAE 2007. So pretty, it's pretty good, right? So if you're a town that doesn't have an energy code or is itching to raise the bar on yourself, doing an ND project would allow you to sort of build this and then point at it and see, see, it wasn't scary. We could do this you know, for the whole city. So, so that was it. Same with water. Uh, more to say about that. So uh, credits and prereqs. Um, for those of you who are planners or re read planning books or uh, you know, study planning history, a, a never smaller subset of the human race <laughs> that qualify each of those things, I like to um, you know, just categorize Smart location linkage is Jane Jacobs. People know who Jane Jacobs was, the great New York uh, activist who uh, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with um, Robert Moses to kill a lot of highways around Manhattan. But she was citizen and activist, great observer. She was the great urbanist. So smart location is about Jane Jacobs meets a guy named Ian McCarg, who was a 70s landscape architect guy who said, no, we've got to, we can't just build anywhere. There's places that are suitable to take development. So those two things, the positive urbanist and the basically the guy saying, no, you can't come here. This is too important. Go somewhere else, right? Those two ideas and tension are what uh, smart location is about. I wanted to just call it, this is the list of things that violates every rule of presentation. You're supposed to have six lines maximum on a PowerPoint slide. So I've got 14. So I'm totally messed up, right? But I want to just pay attention to just the red ones, because I think they're, I just want to highlight them for you. Uh, the first one, compact development. This is, this is the third, what I, from Chicago I can say, the third rail of public discourse on development is density. You know, people call it compact. Anything but the D word, right? So density. So we, we call it compact development. But it is rewarded. Why? Because it's environmental. At increasing levels of density, the environmental performance of our human settlement patterns goes way up. Who has the lowest carbon footprint in the United States? Residents of Manhattan, New York. Not that we should all move to Manhattan. That's not the point. But density corresponds to environmental performance. So it's there. Um, visitability. 
and universal design, this idea that an entire neighborhood, someone who was, uh, had limited mobility, was in a wheelchair, walked with crutches, whatever, could get places, right? So this is a, it's a credit, but it's pointing the way to a vision for what is a sustainable community. So that's in there. Local food production is a credit in Lead ND. So for the first time, you think, oh, Lead, that's all about you know furnaces, or that's about you know windows, or something like that. It's also about gardens and farmers markets and CSAs and things like that. So it's really cool. And then the bottom one, you basically can't see neighborhood schools. So back to this idea of a neighborhood. Who walked to school as a kid? And so who did not? See, it's the younger folk didn't walk, right? So there's a, it used to be 75%, 10, thank you, 75% of people um, walked to school, it's now 25%. And part of it is we designed neighborhood schools away, made them extinct, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna go fast. Historic preservation, district energy systems are all, all in there. So I'm just gonna go fast. I wanted to just have a sampler. It's a 100-page document, it's downloadable on the USGBC website, just take it how you want. One example, which is, I mean, you know, I'm going to skip this. <laughs> it's just, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about this one. That one's complicated. This one's slightly less complicated. So one, one of our criteria, a, an absolute requirement, is in your development, we want a minimum number of intersections. Intersections, street, passage, path, bike path, whatever. You count them uh, accordingly. Why? This is about connectivity. It's the idea that, what you want is uh, for people to be able to get from any point to any other point efficiently. And it turns out that the more intersections you have, which corresponds to smaller and smaller block sizes, corresponds exactly to the willing people's willingness to walk. Right. So a lot of subdivision codes, maybe in the towns you live in, uh, either prevent this sort of finer grain stuff or don't require it. So uh, this could jump from lead ND to your code this afternoon if you wanted to, but it's, it's supported by uh, very good science. So I'm just going to skip through those. And um, don't take my word for it. So we took the lead ND criteria and ran it by these experts at the Centers for Disease Control. So there, there ain't any better authority on public health uh, uh, in the built environment than CDC. And so 57% uh, of the criteria were either directly supported by or consistent with known public health data. And then the rest of it, in their opinion, was a good idea, even if there wasn't specific data backing it up. So it was a ringing endorsement from scientists who are very reluctant to say anything. They just comment on, is it consistent with the data or inconsistent? So this is what I think of as a pretty good endorsement. So it's in the public interest, um, so you can feel comfortable. Uh, with that. How is Lead ND being used in the world? Um, project certification. So developers are coming forward and certifying projects and will be doing so in Michigan shortly if they're not right this minute. Um, many of the projects I'm going to show you are Chicago area or, uh, or the like. Um, this is something that happened really this year. The Chicago Housing Authority, which is a fairly big uh, uh, enterprise in, in uh, the town where I live, <coughs> issued this RFP that required uh, where does it say it? Um, become the first large-scale affordable community in the U.S. to achieve LEED, ND, Gold, or Platinum. So this is a solicitation from the government that says we want a sustainable development. <coughs> Excuse me. We want a sustainable development. And when we want to translate into meeting the LEED, ND criteria at this particular level. So that's the first solicitation. And it's coming from the Housing Authority. If I can just f speak frankly amongst friends and don't repeat this. The CHA is not our most progressive institution in the metropolitan region in Chicago. So for CHA to lead with this is remarkable. So if you're anywhere slightly more progressive than your public housing authority, you got no excuse, right? They provide you no cover. That, that ended. So what else is being used for is um, auditing codes to make sure that lead ND isn't illegal, right? Uh, frankly, lead ND is illegal across the country. Why? Um, some of our zoning minimums uh, violate uh, your zoning maximums, typically, right? If you require a minimum one acre lot, you can't certify under lead ND. It's not dense enough. There isn't enough critical mass for anyone to have any walk to destinations. Everything becomes a drive to destination at that low level of density. So make it legal, make it easy, make it required. A few lead ND projects. <clears throat> now, this is what this is called Dockside Green. It's in Victoria, BC, British Columbia. 
And this is the first project to uh, submit uh, under the pilot program. So the pilot program went live at about 4.30 in the afternoon. At 2.30 the next morning, they had submitted. So it had been nine hours, right? <clears throat> just, just got on it. So they must have stayed up uh, all night. And there was the time change, because these times I'm giving you are Washington, DC. So there are four hours, four time zones later. So, uh, but anyway, an amazing project, 15 acres on the, on the shore in, um, in Victoria. All these, you know, great lists of things that, that are the, the targets, energy reduction 45 to 55, water reduction 65, uh, affordable housing, district systems all over the place. But the top one is the one I want to mention to you or highlight for you. Um, 26 be buildings being built in this project, um, all 26 of them platinum, right? That's pretty good. Uh, and beyond that, the developer posted a million dollar bond forfeitable with the city if all 26 didn't hit platinum. It's putting your money where your mouth is. Now, this guy must be a crazy, crazy environmentalist with no regard for money, right? No, he's an accountant. He's a total bean counter, right? Why did he do it this way? It pencils out. He said, I looked at providing separate mechanical systems and separate this for all the buildings. It's crazy. A district system pays Pays, pays me back. They claim to be making money off their sewage system by drying and converting out the solid waste they get from their sewage to become pelletized fuel to burn in their district energy system. So I'm making more money on it than I thought. Capitalism, right? So there you go. Um, so uh, pretty cool stuff. This is the other one in terms of just you know capitalist values. How are we doing? Five? Great. Thanks. Capitalist values, which I believe believe in. I think you know we need partnerships between government and the private sector, obviously, to get anything done today. And frankly, most leadership things require that. Uh, but in this case, the kind of just if you're a pure capitalist or a libertarian, whatever your stripe, right? You should like this because this is you know not uh, this is making sense. The water feature at the center of this development is uh, also the polishing phase for the sewage treatment plant. Right, because they do all their waste treatment on site. Uh, where are they getting the pro highest per square foot sales prices? The townhouses facing the sewage treatment plant. <laughs> Why? Because it's a water feature, right? You talk about turning, you know, lemons into lemonade. This is it, right? So he's got to be really confident in that wastewater technology that there isn't, you know, June 26 it starts smelling bad, right? Because if it does, he's he's sunk. So he's, you know. He's, he's worked it out. So um, this one's a very inspiring one. So um, closer to home, these are all Chicago or Illinois-based projects. You may have heard of some of them. <clears throat> this one's called Prairie Crossing, which is, uh, has been uh, uh, put forward by a great family, the Ranny family. And they've uh, been pushing sustainability for a long time. Their phase five, the station village, is a lead in the project. This one's called Whistler Crossing. It's a combination of. Uh, Historic preservation and new construction in a south suburban, uh, uh, su south suburb of Chicago, uh, Whistler Crossing. Um, U.S. Steel. You may remember Chicago used to have some steel mills, and they are were on uh, were on Lake Michigan. The biggest of which was U.S. Steel, which was at sort of between 79th and 93rd Street on the south side. <clears throat> the city did a project to raise the bar on the development that's being proposed on the abandoned steel yard and also on the adjacent neighborhood. One of the questions we often get is, OK, I get it that it works for new construction. How about my neighborhood? Can, is lead and useful there? <clears throat> and so we could talk about that in the break or whatever. But we uh, you know, certified both of these things together. And this was born uh, actually out of a, a need by the city. The city kept saying to the developer, we want a green development. He said, OK, what do you want? And the city would say, I told you already. We wanted a green development. He said, well, I know, but I don't know what that is. And so. We settled on Lead ND uh, at a silver level, in, silver level in that case. Uh, Lathrop Poems, I already mentioned. There's the RFP, and so we're back to, back to that pleasant sidewalk. Right? I'm gonna take a deep breath. I speak very quickly when I get flashed the moment. So, so what is this about? So this is about an opportunity. There's a new tool. It's free. It's downloadable. It's on the USGBC website. What I think is probably the right thing to say today is um, I'm a native of Detroit, so I speak Michigan, right? So, um, so I know things aren't, you know, economy could be better, right? 
At the same time, um, a lot of the projects that were about real estate projects and master plan developments, um, many of them in my hometown, like on the waterfront there on East Jefferson, the ones that were going to go ahead in 2006 and 7 and 8, um, when you look at them today, just aren't that good, I'm just being plain spoken. So I think there's an opportunity to retool those. And actually, they're going to need to to be competitive when things thaw out in 11, 12, or 13, whenever it does. And so I think that this is a time, I don't know if you're a religious person, you know, God may have spoken. You know, don't, don't build those bad projects. <laughs> Come back with better projects. So I think there's an opportunity to retool things that are in the pipeline. I also think that this is the time when there's no developer coming to public meetings to oppose any new standard or rule you might consider. This is your moment to sort of get your rules right. Because I will say, doing a lot of code work, as we do, codes always ask for the wrong thing. And it, when you have sustainability in mind, they really ask for the wrong thing. So, so it's weird that we as a society have these rules working on our behalf for, to deliver the public interest that ask for the wrong thing. So two things to consider. Green Build is the big conference for green buildings. That's happening in Chicago in November. And then the Congress for New Urbanism, the annual conference is next, oh, I'm sorry, wrong year, uh, June 1st through 4th, 2011 in Madison. So uh, you know, come to one or both of those things. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.